Sharing Faith Ministries and generous supporters like you. The book of Numbers, the 15th chapter. I'm just going to read a couple of verses of scripture. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As for the assembly, are you there? Yes. Y'all yeah, don't mind if I hasten on, right? As for the assembly, there shall be for both you and the resident alien a single statute, a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You and the alien shall be alike before the Lord. You and the alien who resides with you shall have the same law and the same ordinance. For, for the time that has been allotted to me, I am going to minister from the sermon topic, Mixed Multitude in the House of God. All right. Mixed Multitude in the House of God. Why don't you pray with me? Father, it is in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I arise now by the power of your spirit to proclaim your word. Father, I step into my authority that has been given to me, and I decree what I hear from you. Assign now, Lord, angels to assist me as I advance through this territory. I thank you, O oh Lord, that you have opened up a portal, and even now, as the rain is coming down, it is only symbolic of what the Spirit of the Lord is about to do in this place. I thank you, O oh God, that I am divinely assisted. I thank you that Jehovah Gabor is with me. I thank you, O oh God, that the angels are here making hearts ready. I decree even now that this is a suitable place for this word to go forth. I decree even now that the hearts in this place are ready to receive. God, we bind every distraction and every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus. We declare right now that Jesus is Lord, that your power is present, and that you mean to do business. God, we're going to work, and when we're done, your kingdom will be advanced. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mixed multitude in the house of God. God's people have never been purely alone. Neither are we today. God's churches, those of us who go to church, and those of us who go to church by TV every week. Uh, we who are kingdom minded, we need to understand that we are not purely alone. Say purely alone. In our midst are foreigners and double agents. We may want to be surrounded solely by disciples of Jesus Christ, but a quick survey will disclose that there is a mixed multitude in the house of God. Come on, say mixed multitude. Mixed multitude. The best thing for a ministry worker to realize is that a mixed multitude constitutes your committee. Yes, in the backs of our minds, people of God, we already know this because of the uncomfortable truth pushes us to only select people we figure who are like us. Uh, we, we will pick people to be on our committees that are like us, that we say we can work with. And why? Because we want to avoid what the scripture calls a mixed multitude. Why do we do this? It's because we rather not deal with the mixture of ideals and attitudes and agendas and spirits and personalities that come with a mixed multitude. Recognizing the existence of a mixed multitude in the house of God is not the point of tension in the body of Christ at this time in our dispensations. 
You see, the point of tension, I believe, Pastor, is upon the leader in terms of moving the masses into a kingdom lifestyle. The tension is how do we move the whole mass into a kingdom realization. The tension is how do you get everybody, the whole mass, to move in lockstep in one direction when some in the mass are not present for that purpose. You do know that everybody who's on the church roll is not there for the same reason. And so the question is, when we have a mixed multitude, the challenge is not the fact that they're mixed. We're going to get over that in a minute. But how do you move the whole mass towards a kingdom agenda when you have a mixed multitude? Well, I'm going to tell you how you do it. Number one, what you do is you lay out the blueprint, or I would say, because I'm an engineer, the logistics of what and where God kingdom is all about. You see, before you can move anybody, whether they're the ones with you or the ones that are aliens, as the scripture calls it, you need to lay out the logistics. You need to lay out where we're going. You need to give them the blueprint. So nobody is walking around talking about, what do we do? What do we do? Where are we going? I don't understand. You got to lay it all out there so that everybody would at least have something in hand to let them know where we're going. That's why church models are so important important. That's why the objectives in the ministry and the committees are so important because everybody at least needs to have a blueprint because when they get amnesia about what the ministry is all about, at least they can go back to the blueprint to find out what is it we're supposed to be doing? Who are we supposed to be praising? What are we supposed to be thinking about? So number one, you have to lay out your blueprint and your logistics. Number two, then what you have to do is you have to leverage everything with love. You, you have to leverage everything with love. Uh, the reason why I tell you that is because in Exodus 12, 38, he explains to them that you are going to have people who are with you who are not of you. You're going to have people who are with you who are not of the same bloodline. You're going to have foreigners. And in Leviticus 19 and 33, he's explaining to them, God is explaining that although you have this mixture in your multitude, you have to love them. Come on, somebody say love them. You have to love them. And so the reason why I say you have to leverage everything with love is because the scripture says that love will cover a multitude of sins. And don't you know that even in the church, when you're trying to get God's work done, there's going to be some sin. Sin shows up as offense. Sin shows up as disrespect. Sin shows up as apathy. You're going to have some sin in the household of God. And what you have to do is you got to learn how to leverage all of that with love because when people are in a place where they're resistant, when they're in a place where they're not really there because of why you're there, they're not going to always act right. And see, the tendency is for you to get upset. The tendency is for you to lose a little bit of patience. The tendency is for you to fall back in your flesh and give them a couple of words. You know what I'm saying. The tendency is to rise up on them. You know, the, the tendency is to meet power with power and let them know, no, that's not how we do it here. But but God wanted them to know this is how you deal with the mixed multitude when you're trying to move everybody together. You have to leverage everything with love. Oh, come on. How many of you know that if you just love on your enemies, it will turn everything around. When they're trying to come up against you the wrong way, just put a smile on your face. No, no fake smiles. Come on, let's try to be real. Put a, a smile on your face and tell them I love you with the love of Jesus. Amen. You have to leverage everything with love. Just when you're about to go off, just, just let the love of God come up on your mind and handle it that way. Number one, lay out the blueprint. Number two, leverage everything with love. Number three, you have to launch into language that levels the enemy. <laughs> 
Yeah. I said you have to launch into language that levels the enemy. Try to say that five times. That's a tongue twister. You have to launch. I don't mean creep. I said launch into language that levels the enemy. Dr. Greenbaugh, what you're talking about? I'm talking about what the scripture says. The scripture says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Hallelujah. So that's why you have to launch into language. Say language. You got to start talking key them talk glory to God you have to start talking the word of God because when you start talking kingdom talk it will level the enemy don't you know light and darkness cannot exist in the same place don't you know that when the spirit of the Lord walks in the devil starts getting nervous don't you know that when God rises up his enemies are scattered well if you know all of that start launching into that language you walk in the place and they say I decree and declare that the spirit of the Lord is in this place that everything that won't bow down will fall down that God is holy and there is none other like him that I know that God reigns supreme and he is my God and that there is nobody else like him you gotta learn how to launch into language that will level the enemy that when sickness comes up upon you you launch into the language of healing for I know by his stripes I am healed when the enemy wants to come against your mind, you got to launch into language that lets the enemy know that if I keep my mind stayed on him, he will keep me in perfect peace. You got to learn how to launch into language that will live with the enemy. I know that when you get old, you get a little tired in your body, but you got to learn how to launch into language that will live with the enemy. And you have to tell the devil, I've been young, but now I'm old. And I ain't never seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread. Don't just sit there and take what the enemy is giving. You better learn how to launch into the language that will level your enemy. Come on and shout right there. You got to learn how to launch into language that will level the enemy. But how many of you know that sometimes the words of your mouth and the thoughts of your mind, they seem to fail you. And you're looking at the situation and you don't know what to say. I got something for you right there. You still have to learn how to launch into the language of the enemy. Pastor, what you're talking about? In other words, the scripture tells us that there is a language on the inside of you that moanings and groanings cannot interpret, but the Spirit of the Lord will begin to speak for you, that the Spirit of the Lord will begin to interpret the situation and the mind of God, and he will do the talking, and he will do the moving, so when you run out of natural words, just move in through the Holy Spirit and begin to pray in the Spirit. Come on, people of God, why don't you practice it right about now? Come on and practice it. Come on, don't just look at me. Come on, get in the gear. Launch into it. I'm trying to tell you. We're getting ready to shift the atmosphere. Something's getting ready to break. You better rise up and start talking. Your spiritual language. Come on and join me right here. Your son we gonna take a station break for some Holy Ghost conversation. I Come on and join me. Open up your mouth and talk to the Lord. Open up your mouth and speak to Him. You gotta launch into some Holy.
today to recalibrate the atmosphere in the house of God. Come on and join me. Open up your mouth and begin to launch into your language. Be seated, but keep talking to the Lord. Don't, don't stop talking, because this ain't over. Don't stop talking. Come on, you, you can sit and talk in the spirit. Come on. You, you can listen to me preach and still talk to God in the spirit. Come on, don't stop, don't stop. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Y'all not, listen, if I was somewhere else, I'd have to do a whole lot of lessons, but I'm here, so you know. Come on, come on, keep talking, keep talking. You got to lay out the blueprint. You gotta lay out the logistics so that so that the foreigners will know where we're going. And then you gotta leverage everything with the love of God. And then you have to launch into your language that levels the enemy. But the word of God says that God spoke to Moses directly about the mixed multitude in Leviticus 19 and 33. He says to him, listen, quote unquote, when an alien resides with you in your land. In other words, what Moses wanted him to know and what Moses wants us to know even now is that we will have some aliens in our land. In other words, we're going to have a mixed multitude. I'm not trying to put anybody on front street, but if you do a scan down your row, there's a good chance there's somebody on your row that's an alien. I don't want you to make anybody uncomfortable. I, I really don't, but the chances are, if it's not your row, it might be that row behind you, but I promise you, I promise you that somebody up in the house, somebody on some row, it might be somebody in the choir, so I dare not look at that room right, right now, but somewhere in the house, there's some aliens up in the house. There, there's a mixed, mo I know I'm right about it, because God told Moses when. In other words, there's going to be some in the house. Glory to God, there's going to be some aliens up in the house. But he says to him, listen, when the alien is with you, we got to deal with this because every pastor wants a church where everybody's saved. Just not going to be that. Every denomination wants churches that are on fire and going forward with strong. It's not going to be like that. You know why? Because we're not pure. I'm, I'm having a good time. Stay with me. Stay, this is not the time to go to sleep. Amen. God says that when an alien resides in your land, number one, he told, he said to him, he said, listen, do not oppress the alien. It's in the scripture. Don't oppress the alien. I know we want to kick them all out. I know we, I know we, I know we want to do wrong to them, but he says, don't oppress them. Number two, he says, you need to treat them like a citizen. This is important. This is important because I'm telling you, there's some aliens up in here. I'm looking at aliens. There are aliens everywhere, glory to God, but, but I'm not here to oppress you, alien. I'm not, I'm not, here, I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm, I'm here to make you feel like a citizen. And then he tells them, he said, you have to love them as yourself. Yeah, so, so now the aliens are feeling pretty good, amen, because now they know they're not going to be oppressed, they're not going to be treated badly, and they're going to be loved, amen. And, and then here's the kicker right here, Lady Tracy, here's the kicker. He says that, that listen, there has to be one God to be worshipped. And, and see, that really is the problem. That, that, that's the problem right there because they don't mind you not oppressing them. They don't mind you treating them like a citizen. Everybody wants equal rights, right? <laughs> <laughs> they think it's a human issue. I, I mean, yeah, they think it's a civil rights or human rights issue. I'm, I'm talking politics, but let me come back here. Amen. So they don't mind that. They, they don't mind you. Uh, well, we love each other. They, they don't mind that. They don't mind your love. The problem that we find is when it comes down to this last point, and there's going to be one God. Oh, shucks now. There's going to be one God, and guess what? Everybody's going to worship the one God. And that's where we come into our problem in the household trying to move everybody into a kingdom agenda. And so this is the question that I had for the Lord, and this is why he has sent me here to do some things. How do you get the alien, the mixed multitude, to adhere to the command that there's going to be one God worship? Exactly, if I have to love them and I can't oppress them, I can't legislate their worship, if I can't force their worship, if I can't manipulate
manipulate their worship, if I can't intimidate them into worship, if I can't guilt them into worship, if I can't oppress them to worship, if I can't restrict them until they worship, exactly how in the world are we going to get the alien and the mixed multitude to adhere to the command, and it is a command, that you will have one God and there will be one worship. There's one statue and there's one ordinance. If I can't force them to do it, how am I going to get them to adhere? After all, you're not their God. After all, we don't have the same blood. After all, they don't even see themselves like me. And, and so how am I going to get them to adhere? The scripture says that there will be one single statue, and this is a mandate. This seems like it puts the people in a precarious situation. Wait a minute, God. You're going to hold me accountable for the alien that's around me. You're going to make me love this alien. You're going to make me respect them and treat them like a citizen. And then you're going to tell me that this alien who is with me has to worship you who he don't know. This is not an instruction to be here to uh, uh, when, when they were living in, outside of captivity. You see, this, this was an instruction that he said, when you come into the land that I've promised, you got to go back to the beginning of the chapter. When you come into the place where I have blessed you, then if you have some aliens with you, they must worship me. Y'all, come on, come on, come, come on now. See, this is not an instruction for when they are held up in captivity. This is an instruction for when they have come into their blessed place. This is an instruction for when they have come to the place where God has given to them that when you get to where it, you get to make the rules. When you come into the land where you're in charge, when you come into the land where you are the focus, then this was what has to happen. One worship of one God and his name is Jehovah. In other words, you have this mixed multitude who has a different bloodline, but that's okay. When you come into the place I have set you, everybody is going to worship me. And we, listen, we need to understand that because we have come to a place in God where we, some of us, are walking in our promised land. Everybody is not in captivity, and the church ought to know that. There are some congregations that have walked into their promised place. They are no longer held bound by religious captivity. They are no longer held bound by who, who say you can't speak in tongues and who say you can't get up and worship and who say you can't have instruments in the church. Every church is not in captivity. Y'all ought to say amen right there. Some churches are in freedom for where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and some churches are walking in that liberty. Some churches are walking in the freedom of God. Everybody's not bound and when I look around, Citadel don't look bound to me. It looks to me like you are walking in the freedom that God has made available to you. You look like to me people who know the Lord and Savior for yourself. You look like to me people who know what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So since you are walking in your free place, it's time for you to rise up and let the enemy know we set the rules up in here. We establish what will and will not be. We design what the protocol is because there will be the worship of one God, one Lord, and one baptism. When you are free, you get to set the rules. It's a whole other message for churches that are not free, but when you're someplace where you're free, where the leader is free, and the leader got a revelation, then there is the time where you need to walk up and say, okay, alien, this is how it's going to be. Listen, I need to tell you this, uh, because this is how we get a, a, a little bit mixed up. We assume that people who are with us in body are with us in spirit. Just because the alien was with the multitude did not make them with the multitude. And, and the other part we get messed up is that we mistakenly conclude that if a person is not doing something the way we're doing it, that they are an alien. If they're not Holy Ghost filled, speaking in tongues, free enough to shout that they're an alien. And I have to tell you that that's not necessarily true. 
The reason why it's not necessarily true is because they may have been in churches. All their life with no revelation. But they're tied to the church. Even though they're getting no revelation, no impartation, no deliverance, no supernatural, no tongues, no healing, no power from God. But they're tied to the church so they can't do because they've not been exposed. And so they, since they don't speak in tongues and raise up hands and they don't move in faith like we move in faith, we conclude that they're aliens and that's not necessarily the case. What we need to do is look at people who have been exposed to truth who've been exposed to the power of God, who have been exposed to revelation, and yet they don't do. Now that's the alien. You mean to tell me you've been sitting up under all of those classes on finances and trusting God with your finances and the truth of seed time and harvest and you still won't tithe? You an alien. You mean to tell me you've been up in church and you've been in the line, you've been anointed 2,500 times and you still sick and you still in doubt? You the alien. You mean to tell me you've been up in church and you've been listening to the preaching and you still can't tell me what Genesis 1 and 1 is? You the alien. You mean to tell me that you can be up under all of this anointing and then the presence of God come in and you don't move? You the alien. Come on. It's not the fact that you don't know. It's the fact that you've been taught and you know and you still won't do. You the alien. You the alien. Well, let me, let me bring this to a close because here is why I've really been sent. I think I got it all laid out. I think I did all of my lecturing homework. Did I do that? You understand the fact that God made it very clear that when you get into your promised land, you are going to have some aliens with you. God has made it very clear that you can't ever always identify the alien by what a person doesn't do when they don't know, but what a person won't do when they do know so that you can accurately identify who the alien is. Did y'all get that? When you find out who the alien is, you're supposed to treat him with love. You're supposed to treat him like a citizen. You're supposed to do him right. Did y'all get that? The preceding program is a Greenhouse production. Come where vision grows.